A test for a rock-solid friendship. Israel's Prime Minister warns he's willing to risk friction with the US. Benjamin Netanyahu says it is a price worth paying to neutralize Iran's nuclear ambitions. Will it be viewed as a parting shot, as political rivals to push him from power? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby here in Doha. Now, for decades, the Israeli relationship with the United States has been unshakable. It is crucial for Israel's security and the U.S. government's foreign policy across the broader Middle East. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu says he is willing to risk, quotes, friction. The caretaker prime minister, whose political future does hang in the balance, of course, made those remarks whilst announcing David Barnier as the new head of Israel's spy agency Mossad. Mr Netanyahu said Israel's priority is to neutralize Iran's nuclear ambitions, even if the US and others succeed in reinstating the 2050 nuclear deal. <laughs> If we have to choose, I hope it doesn't happen between friction with our great friend, the United States, and the elimination of the existential threat. The elimination of the existential threat is increasing. It falls on you, on the political leadership of the State of Israel, and you, David Barnier. All must be done, all, to ensure that under no circumstances will Iran arm itself with nuclear weapons. OK, let's get going with our guests. Out of Tel Aviv, we have Danny Danon, formerly the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. In London, we have Roxanne Farman Fameyan, a lecturer on modern Middle East politics at the University of Cambridge. And in Washington, Lawrence Korb, who served as US Assistant Secretary of Defence. Welcome to the programme to all of you. Danny Danon in Tel Aviv first. How far is Mr Netanyahu prepared to push this relationship when it comes to having a friction-based relationship with Joe Biden? We have a very strong bond uh, with the US, a strong uh, alliance which is based on the mutual values, uh, and it will continue to be the same way. Uh, having said that, we have to remember that uh, in the history, we proved that when we take uh, decisions by ourselves regarding our security, uh, at the end, the US actually has supported. I will give you two examples. When Prime Minister Menachem Begin decided to attack the nuclear reactor in Iraq. The U.S. administration was against it. They condemned it uh, fearfully. But years later, they actually thanked Israel for doing that. And it happened again when Prime Minister Olmert decided to attack the nuclear reactor in Syria, when President Bush said that he was against it initially. But after that, he, he gained, he, he, he really gained his respect all over again. So yes, we do speak with our colleagues. We value their opinion, but at the end, we will take the actions which are important for our survival, our security. So that means adopting a very aggressive stance towards the government in Tehran? Uh, that, that means to take actions uh, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. When a radical regime is threatening to destroy Israel, we cannot sit idly by and wait to see whether we immediate it or not. History has taught us uh, that we cannot do that. So we expect the international community to take strong actions. But if we will believe that the, the actions that are being taken are not efficient, we will do whatever is necessary to protect ourselves. Lawrence Corbyn, in Washington, how far will Mr Biden push back against that kind of very set stance? Well, I think he pushed back when he was vice president and then and when Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the United States and took the unprecedented step of addressing the U.S. Congress and told them not to approve a deal that the Obama-Biden administration had uh, made uh, with, uh, <clears throat> uh, with, uh, with Iran. So I think that he will push back. He has given the getting back into the Iran nuclear deal the highest priority. That's why the negotiations are going on back in uh, uh, back in uh, Vienna Vienna right now so I, I think he will push back uh, very very hard against uh, against this because 
this is a priority because a nuclear armed Iran would completely destabilize the, the Middle East. It is a bigger threat than anything else that's going on, whether it's in Yemen or Syria uh, or, or, or what, what have you. Roxanne Faman Famian, uh, put this in the context of not the immediate past, not just literally the last month or so, but the wider picture of context when it comes to a friction based relationship between Jerusalem and Washington, not, I guess, what it should be in a perfect world, a frictionless relationship. Yes, I would argue that probably there already has been quite a bit of friction. And uh, in fact, as your guest pointed out, there's been friction in the past uh, between both powers. And certainly over the last year, there's been quite a bit of tit for tat and an increase in attacks by Israel or allegedly by Israel on Iran. In fact, just today, a, a the largest uh, ship in their navy was sunk uh, in, a, in the form of a fire that is very unexpected. There was a, a clearly an explosion. This is quite typical of what's been going on um, between Israel uh, against Iran. And although I would argue that the level of sabotage and friction has been high enough that the uh, Americans must be aware of this uh, activity on by, by Israel against Iran, and must agree to it at some level, there's obviously a question to be asked as to how far that friction can go. And as they are negotiating the JCPOA, if that does go ahead, then the situation will change enormously. And the U.S. will not want to have Israel uh, making the situation for Iran increasingly difficult. Lawrence Corbyn, Washington. Israel wants as a, a prerequisite to even giving the slightest green light to the new JCPOA, if we can call it that, some sort of re-energized, reinvigorated 2015 nuclear deal, pulling Iran back into this welcoming open church of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons in the Middle East. What are the safeguards that Israel wants that Mr. Biden's administration would be OK with? Well, I think if you can get back into the JCPOA, and then you could begin working on <clears throat> the the other issues. Uh, Iran developing ballistic missiles, uh, you know, for example, would be another one that they could begin to work on. Uh, the Iranians working uh, with the other countries to have peace in Yemen by cutting back their support of the of the Houthis. But for the Biden administration, the nuclear is really the beginning, because if that doesn't work, nothing else uh, is involved. And don't forget, the United States over the years, when I had the privilege of working for President Reagan, he got very upset when the Israelis bombed the reactor in, in, in Iraq at Osirik. And, and basically, when they invaded Lebanon, pri uh, President Reagan called up, you know, Begin and basically, to quote him, read him the riot act. We cut down uh, sending military supplies to Israel and, in fact, sent the AWACS to Saudi Arabia at that time. So I think there is a history of us reacting if the uh, Israelis push too far. Danny Danon in Tel Aviv, do you understand those voices out of Israel, people who write for, say, the Jerusalem Post, who were saying when the last conflict, the one that we covered ad nauseum here on Al Jazeera, the fourth war in three and a bit years between Israel and, in effect, between Israel and Hamas, there were voices out of Israel saying what Netanyahu did there was about political expediency and about political survival, because if he picks a fight with Hamas, that gets him six more months as Israeli prime minister. You know, uh, a derivative of that, if you will, is if he picks a fight with Tehran, that maybe gets him another 12 months as Israeli prime minister. So you just uh, mentioned uh, two lies. Uh, and let's look at the reality. Uh, we protected ourselves from the hostility coming from Hamas. And when you speak about the political uh, timeline, uh, as we speak, uh, Israeli parliament is in final negotiations for forming a different government without Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and, and we are very happy that uh, we, we got to a ceasefire a few days ago, and we are not in the cycle again. And the same with Iran. We put uh, our national security above politics, uh, and we have today cooperation between, between two different parties. 
uh, Benny Gantz, who is the Minister of Defense, and Netanyahu from the Likud party, and they collaborate on the security issues. So we do not involve and we do not mix politics in our national security. But, but I want to go back to your last question uh, to my colleague. Uh, the JCPOA was bad for Israel in 2015, and it is even worse today. Uh, and the main issues we are raising and, and we are telling our allies in Washington to address is the ballistic missile tests, is the nuclear ambitions, uh, the proxies, the millions, billions of dollars that the proxies will receive from Tehran. Uh, all of those issues will not be addressed if the U.S. will re-enter the JCPOA in the next few days. Roxanne Farman Fimian in London. Is there implicitly here an asymmetric relationship, a kind of a, a tail wagging the dog relationship? One would want to assume, I guess, that the superpower in the room, the United States, tells Israel what to do and Israel reacts to that. Instead of which, it seems to me that Israel does something and then it's the United States that reacts to what Israel is doing. Well, I think it's very much dependent on the events because although certainly Israel was not supportive of the JCPOA signing in 2015 and expressed uh, a certain level of threat that they would take care of their own national security despite that signing, nonetheless, it was the U.S. decision to make that, that signature uh, uh, deal go forward, and certainly the uh, Netanyahu and Israel stepped back. And actually, that that was a year that followed that signing that we see was one of the more peaceful in the most recent five or six years in, in the region. And I think that one of the things that is clear about the JCPOA is that it implies regional uh, security issues. It is the trigger. Once it is signed, it's been made very clear by the Biden administration that they have every intention of going right into negotiations over missiles. And until that trust has been set up and until some kind of understanding has been established, which we've already seen happen already once back in 2015, 2016, and the nuclear production in Iran dropped precipitously at that point. So, in many ways, it shows that the concerns of Israel are answered by the signing of the JCPOA. Once that is signed again, uh, then the next step will inevitably follow. And we're also seeing that there is a, um, a rapprochement that's already in train between Saudi Arabia and Iran in order to address some of their concerns, militias, and uh, their conflict across uh, the Gulf. So I think the very act of starting the negotiations again with the JCPOA and uh, putting that as a possible uh, success will serve to, to uh, calm the situation. And I think Israel will see that the U.S. decision uh, is the right way forward. And it has its own knitting to deal with at the moment. Uh, certainly, it's about to go through a, uh, a change of premiership, perhaps, just like Iran is about to go through a change of presidency. So we see quite a few new actors, both in the United States and in the Gulf, that are willing to try something new, because the past cer certainly has not worked. Well, Israel's defense minister, Benny Gantz, says Israeli-U.S. differences should be solved without defiant rhetoric. He's been dispatched on a snap visit to Washington, where he's expected to make a $1 billion request to the Pentagon to restock the Iron Dome missile system. It fended off most of the more than 4,300 rockets fired from Gaza during Israel's recent conflict with Hamas. The U.S. gives Israel billions of dollars in aid every year. In 2020, it was just shy of $4 billion Billion, almost all of it goes into the military, and Washington is committed to an Obama-era deal that would last through until 2028. It provides almost $40 billion over 10 years. I think it's safe to expect that among the things they will talk about uh, are regional security issues, and clearly uh, we have every expectation that Iran and their malign behavior in the region will certainly come up. Um, this is obviously uh, not the first time that uh, the secretary has met or spoken with Minister Gantz. They've had n numerous phone calls, which we've all read out to you uh, over the last couple of weeks with, with respect to Gaza. And, of course, uh, we visited Israel n not too long ago, and they had a very extensive day together. 
So uh, this, we expect uh, Thursday's meeting will be a continuation of those discussions, but clearly regional security issues will be at the top of the list. Lawrence Corbyn, Washington, there are, there are so many sort of dichotomies in this relationship, surely. I mean, one could argue and say, look, the optics around the relationship have changed because Benny Gantz is imminently in Washington on the one hand. But on the other hand, May the 17th, this fourth war in just over three years is at its peak or heading towards being at its peak. And the Biden administration signs off on arms deals worth $735 million worth of precision guided weapons. I mean, that was either bad timing, bad luck, or just stupid. Well, basically, there were more members of Congress this time, including two Jewish senators who were opposed to that $735 million deal. Biden has gone ahead with it. But the relationship between the United States and Israel is getting back to kind of a more normal relationship. For the longest time, our main goal was to make sure that the Israelis were not overthrown, as we happened in 67 and 73. But Israel has become a much more uh, significant power. They're as powerful as anybody in the region. I don't think any of the countries could, uh, you know, uh, uh, beat them militarily as they tried back in 67 and 73. So we're going to have these good moments, we're going to have these bad moments, and we're not going to agree on, 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 on everything. And as you mentioned, we give them $4 billion a year in military aid, no strings attached. <clears throat> and basically, if you take a look at the Iron Dome, who, thank heavens, performed so wonderfully during the recent conflict with Hamas, that basically, a lot of that money and technology came from the United States. So we will guarantee Israel's independence. But on the other hand, we're going to do what's best for the United, United States. And we really feel that this nuclear deal is good for Israel. But obviously, there are many people who don't. They have other issues with Iran. But remember, during the Cold War, when we signed arms reduction agreements with nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union, they were still controlling Eastern Europe. They were in Afghanistan. So you've got to solve each issue as it comes up. You can't solve everything in one place. And I happen to believe, as President Obama did and President Biden, that the nuclear issue is the biggest issue in the region, both for all of the countries and for the United States. Danny Denon in Tel Aviv. Is there a chance here that whoever is prime minister has to be less belligerent than Benjamin Netanyahu has been to date? Because possibly, can I suggest to you that Joe Biden has a rather non-nuanced idea of what Israel is. He seems to perceive Israel as one layer of being, quote, the only parliamentary democracy in the Middle East, surrounded by Arab and Muslim autocracies. And this region is so much more complicated than that simplistic view of what Israel is as a prism into examining the wider region. So President Biden is a, is a good friend of Israel. And we saw it uh, during the last uh, cycle, the, the moral support we received, uh, because the U.S. is the greatest friend and greatest ally of the U.S. Uh, and uh, we heard about the Congress members that actually fought against the support we received from the U.S. And I want to remind you that we fought Hamas. We fought evil. We fought the same organization, a terrorist organization that supported Al-Qaeda and celebrated the vicious attacks uh, on 9-11. So uh, that when we fight evil, we expect it, and we do get the support of our allies in the U.S. It has nothing to do with the personality... Mr. Danon, I'm going to interrupt you there, sir, because Hamas has never publicly supported al-Qaeda, and what Hamas has done, Hamas has only ever done it in its relationship... No, 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 no just let me finish, sir. This is, this is a matter of fact. <laughs> Historical fact would show what I'm about to say as being historically correct. Hamas has only done what it's done across the border from Gaza into Israel. It has never gone wider than that. So I, I don't want to have a conversation about allegiances no. between different groups that operate on the ground in that way. I do want to come to... I just want to get to one other point. Please, just allow me to move the conversation on. And I want to go back to Roxanne Faman for me, Anne. No, no, excuse me. You're going to let me speak, Peter, and answer you. Because you just said a lie. After 9-11, Hamas issued a statement. And I stand behind my words, supporting the acts in Al-Qaeda. You can Google it right now. No, that wasn't what I said. That was not what I said. 
So maybe you should check your facts, Peter, because you said a lie and don't blame me for not knowing that, the facts. That was you can not do it right now. that, Mr. Dan Answer, and, and that was not that. what I said. That was not what I said. What I said was that Hamas has always contained itself to doing what it does in its relationship with Israel out of Gaza, across the border into Israel. That was very specifically and very clearly what I said. OK, so I do just want to move so the conversation on. No connection to Al -Qaeda, and I insist that they supported Al Qaeda after the attack on 9-11. It's evil. We fight evil. That's why we get the support from the US. Let me just move the conversation on. Roxanne Fermanian in London there. Is there a problem here for whoever is Israeli prime ministers, is Israeli prime minister rather? And it's a problem perhaps that's yet to come. It's the younger Jewish American lobby who are turning away from what Israel seems to be at the moment. Well, I think that uh, at the moment we've we've seen a very specific uh, chapter in the relationships in the Middle East and also in relationship to the United States. I think there's certainly a group within uh, a younger group, if you will, within the United States generally, within the Democratic Party specifically, but also uh, in some of the uh, those that would say that they were Republicans. It's quite a difficult uh, point to, to to finesse. But in any case, that do see that there are other types of uh, younger people rising up and wanting to have uh, a, a, a sense of liberty and control over their politics, including Hong Kong and elsewhere. And the result is that the Palestinians, particularly those inside Israel, I would say, have fallen into that category. The use of TikTok, the use of social media generally is creating a very different communications environment that is making a, a difference in terms of political uh, vantage. And I think also, if I could go back to the situation in Iran, I think that uh, many of those young people looking outside in feel as though there too, the, the, the reformist government that has in many ways captured the, the imagination and hopes of many young people both in and out of Iran now is uh, being moved out and instead a very much more conservative group is moving in and we are seeing a very, very low um, voter turnout as a result, a sense of hopelessness. Okay. Okay. So I think we're seeing that whole wave, if you will. Roxanne, apologies for interrupting you. Danny, in the next oh, 60 no. seconds, because we are heading towards the end of the programme, Danny Danon in Tel Aviv. Does Mr Netanyahu want a war with Iran, a war with Hamas? Does he want to maintain the status quo or does he just want to be in high political office as long as he can possibly do that? No, absolutely not. We pray for peace uh, and we just uh, signed four peace treaties with the Arab nations and hopefully we'll have more more treaties uh, coming in the near future. But at the same time, we will look uh, at the threats, at the challenges in the region, and we understand that Hamas, uh, that Iran is behind Hezbollah, behind Hamas, and that's why we are very worried, and we are willing to take actions against Iran. And it's not about Netanyahu. If in two hours we will have a new prime minister, and it might happen, okay. it will have the same policy. Lawrence Corb in Washington, what does Mr Biden want? Does he want less Netanyahu, peace in the Middle East, a two-state solution, or does he just want to maintain things as they are and keep a lid on it? Well, basically, he wants to keep a lid on it. I think he would prefer that Prime Minister Netanyahu step aside and you have another government. <clears throat> he feels he could work better with them about dealing with all the uh, all the issues in the uh, region and i think as was pointed out by my colleague in london a lot of young jewish people in the united states do support us moving in that direction okay we have to leave it there thank you all thank you to our guests they were danny danon roxanne faman fameyan and lawrence corb and thank you too for watching the program you can see the show again anytime via the website aljazeera.com and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye-bye.